Hey, church, if you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14 to 30. We're going to be looking at uh, the faithful servants today. A question I have for you is, what is a faithful servant? A faithful servant is one who is basically faithful to the master. That's what a real servant is. And today we're going to be looking at a parable. We're looking at Jesus um, speaking about a parable. And this is the main idea that I want to get across this morning is that faithful servants are those that honor the master's resources and to make his priorities our priorities that we would risk for the kingdom of God. So that's the big idea for, for this morning. So you can see that here the, there's a setting that Jesus is giving a parable, is telling us parable. And let's say, what is a parable? A parable is a story that has a punchline to it. And um, so it's like like a joke. But can you imagine having a joke and there's no punchline? Okay, so a parable has a punchline to it. 
So when you when you hear the story, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Now in a parable, it's just a, it's a story that people can relate to, and we are not going to press all the details for meaning in the parable. We're looking for the basically the punchline or punch lines. And what we're talking about right now is a parable that's related to the kingdom of God and, uh, and our faithfulness to the king who is, uh, who is Jesus, who is king of the kingdom. So let's take a look at Matthew 25 and verse 14. It says, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to, to them while he was gone. So here again, you can imagine Jesus sitting and he's telling this, this parable. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven in Matthew is basically the same thing as the kingdom of God. Because Matthew is, is writing to Jews and Jews didn't, didn't, like, they didn't pronounce the name of God because it's so sacred. So they would just say kingdom of, they would say the heaven is where God is. And so kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is the same thing. Now, what is the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God? It's basically the rule of God, the reign of God in our life. When God is ruling in it, that's where the kingdom of God is, is found. Okay, so he says that the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story. That's the parable. Parable is a story. Again, I'm going to wait for the punchline. It's a story of a man going on a long trip. And he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Now he says he, he entrusted his money to the servants. Some translations have slaves. It's basically the same, same word. But um, for us, slaves have a different connotation. So servants, we can kind of see, okay, servants, um, they, they're not like the slaves that we think of. But in those days, so servants were basically trusted people, depending on who they were, um, of the business of the master. They were educated, a lot of them were educated, and they were uh, they had skill in, in taking care of things. But not all of them, but a lot of them did. And so these owners, these, these rich people, they, they would entrust their, their business and the, the, the management of the, the house to these servants. Because a lot of times the, the owners, they would go on trips. And they were, because they're making deals or they're, um, you know, building connections to help build their business. And so they would give these sort of like senior managers, these senior uh, servants, um, these positions of uh, trust. So what did he do? In verse 15, he says, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. Now, when it says five bags of silver, some of you might have, in your translation, five bags of gold. So why is that? Well, others might have the, the, the term a talent. Well, all that means is, um, we talk about a talent or the five, it's just it's a sum of money. It's a measure of money. And in those days, they just call it a talent. Um, but it would be like uh, five bags of silver, okay? Now, these... And these um, bags of silver, the sum of money, are not abilities. Um, okay, it's a, a talent is a weight, which later became a large unit of money. They're, they are rather the responsibility the Lord gives His people in the light of their abilities and opportunities. So it's not a talent in the ways we would use it. See, we use a talent like an ability. It is not a gift, as we control it, it is not an ability of which we might boast. It's actually an investment which the master makes in us, his servants. In us, his servants, he wants us to be able to rely on us in his use. So here he is, he's going to give them these five, uh, he gives five bags to one, two bags to other, and one bag of, of, to another, because he wants to, he wants to see what you're going to do with it. He's giving you an opportunity to do certain things with his money. Now, it's interesting thing here. We're talking about the kingdom of God. So we see here that in the kingdom of God, there are different levels of responsibility, which is kind of interesting. Because in our society, we think that everything has to be equal. We need a one size fits all kind of a servant, you know, in terms of responsibilities. And they, no, in the kingdom of God, it gives us a clue that there are different levels of responsibility. Now, let me ask you a question. Why does he give these guys, um, these money. And it's quite a, 
actually it's quite a, a big, a large sum of money. Why does he give it to them? Um, so, so just to give it to them? And so the, the servant said, oh, <laughs> master, thank you for the money. No, he wants, he want, the master wants them to adopt his priorities. That they will in some way further his business. Okay, he didn't just give them for no reason, just for them to have a vacation and spend money on their own. He wants to see what they're going to do with it while he's gone. In verse 16, it says, The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. Other translations will say he immediately went to go to work on this, okay? He invested it. He traded it. He put the money to work. He was doing business with it, and it has the idea that he invested and reinvested, and you know what happened? He earned five more. Now, again, why would he, why would he do that? Because he was honoring the master's resources to make the master's business goals his goals, to be productive for the master. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus wants his disciples to do the same thing, to be like that, to be enthusiastic, to immediately go and take, and when you see an opportunity come, you risk it and you go for it, looking for the kingdom. And so you see here, there is no fear for him. He just went out and he did what he could do. In verse 17, the second servant with the two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. So here's another one. He just went out, no fear, took the opportunity that was given to him. But in verse 18, it says, but the servant who, who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Hmm. He hid the master's money. Basically, he avoided the opportunity that was given to him. He didn't do anything with it. But yet, he knew something about the master. So, in verse 19, it says this. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they used his money. So, again, here's the clue is that he didn't just give the money. The master didn't give the money to the servant just for nothing. He expected something because he's coming back. He says, you're going to give an account of how you use the money, what you did with the opportunity with the money. Now, in this sense here, it says a long time after the master returned, there's kind of two ways of looking at this. Well, a lot of people think that this is the second coming. At the second coming, um, Jesus will come back and then um, he will give an account for us. Another view is that this is actually referring to the end of the age or the end of the Jewish age, which resulted in the destruction of the temple. Because in chapter 24, it talks about the destruction of the temple, and this is a continuation of it. Um, so, um, but anyhow, whatever, whatever way you look at it, there's going to be an accounting for it, okay? But I want you to think about this. If it's a second coming, that's one thing. Or if it's the destruction of the temple, that there was a there was an accounting in their lifetime, that's another thing. Because in this parable, the master came back when they were still alive. So just keep that in mind. And so he wants to give he wants an account of what they did. What did you do with the opportunity that I gave you? And in this context of Jesus' ministry, the sums of money entrusted to the slaves are more likely to represent not natural endowments given to men in general, but the, but the specific privileges and opportunities of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the, uh, the master gave him an opportunity. He wanted to see what they would do with it. So in uh, verse 20, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with the five more. He said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. Now, he wasn't boasting. He was just being, he's saying, I've been faithful to what your priorities have been. And then, then he says here, the master says in 21, was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. And so let's celebrate together. So you see here, that um, the master affirms him, gives him affirmation. You're you're a good uh, you're a good servant, and he gives him a promotion. You're gonna get you're gonna be able to um, have more responsibilities, and then there's a celebration. Pretty neat, right? Um, he was faithful. 
He was faithful to the resources of the master and made the master's priority his priority, and he took the opportunity to enrich his master's business. Verse 22, uh, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I've earned two more. Now, again, he wasn't bragging. He just said, I've been faithful with the opportunity that you gave me. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Affirmation. Uh, promotion. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'm going to give you more responsibilities. Celebration. Let's celebrate together. That's pretty neat, right? He was faithful because what did he do? He honored the resources of the master and made the master's priority our priority, his priority. So it gives us a clue that in the kingdom of God, God wants us to be faithful, to honor the resources that he gives to us, because it all belongs to him, and make his priority our priority, to do something with the opportunities that he gives us. Now let's con contrast this with the, with the one bag servant. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. And look, here's your money back. Oh, my goodness. Here, the one bag servant gave him an excuse. He said, I knew you were harsh. He even accused uh, his master of being dishonest and harsh. So he says, I was afraid. And so what I did was I hid it, and here it is. And you know what happens? He did not honor the master's resources by making the master's priority his priority. And he did nothing. He did nothing. Now think about that. The master gave him money for what reason? For an opportunity to be showing himself faithful. Now if the master wanted to save his money, he didn't have to give it to anybody, right? He just hold on for himself. He didn't have to do that. But the point is that he gave this servant an opportunity according to his abilities. And you know what? He didn't even try. Brothers and sisters, that's the punchline. It's not that we have stuff and we do the best that we can with it. No, it's that we'll, with the stuff and the resources that God gives you, are you willing to even try? So look what the master says. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. You see, the master was not concerned about getting his money back. He could, he could have done, he could have, again, he could not, he could have just saved the money, hold on to the money, not give it to the servant. But he wanted to see what the, the servant would do with it when he gave him the opportunity. And he says, you're lazy because you could have just taken it to the bank and got interest on it. But you wouldn't even do that. Even with the opportunity that I gave you, you wouldn't even do that, you wicked and lazy servant. Because you wasted an opportunity to show yourself faithful. And by the way, in those days, according to Craig Keener, the banks were very, um, uh, very safe investment. It was a safe investment. All you could have done is taken and taken it to the bank and got some interest in it. But he didn't even do that. He just hit it. And so what you what you find here is that this servant here that had no real concern for the master's priorities. Verse 28. Then he ordered, uh, the master said, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from but from those who have nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Wow. You're talking about, you know, you're talking about, there, there are some consequences for not taking the opportunities that God gives you for the kingdom. He says, he says he takes that away and he gives it to the one that already has more. Why? Because he's already shown himself faithful that he will do something. He will, he will follow the, the, um, the master's priorities to do the, the priorities of the master. In this case, the business. For us, it's the kingdom of God. Now, I was thinking about 
about this. And I was thinking about when I was in high school, I think it was, that in, at, at church, someone had given me the opportunity to teach a little kid's um, Sunday school class. And so I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and try it. So I prepared. I did everything you can think of just to get ready for this one class. And when I went, there, went in there, it was a complete failure. I mean, I mean, it was just, it was a bomb. But, but here's the point is that I tried. And so I told the Sunday school director, I said, you know, this, this is no good. So I said, how about this? How about you try this other class? It was a junior high class. And so I said, okay. So here the opportunity came to me and I tried the class. And it was amazing. The class was just alive. And I was like, okay, this is something that's really kind of cool. And throughout the time, as I was teaching, I began to teach the college class. And then I began to teach the adult class. In other words, when I was faithful with the little, then another, I was given more responsibility. I was given a little bit more. And to the point that, um, fast forward, that by the time I graduated from seminary, seminary asked me to teach. And it wasn't because, you know, I think it was because if I hadn't taken those opportunities that God had given to me, I may not, I might have been like the, the lazy servant. I said, no, no, I, I don't want to do anything. You see, that's the punchline of this parable. And traditionally, we kind of say that, the, 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 that we want to do the things, we want to do good things with the things we already have for the kingdom. Okay, but everybody knows that. But see, that, that's not what a parable does. The parable is to change your thinking about something. And when you look at this, it says that faithful servants honor the master's resources and take the opportunities to fulfill the master's priorities. And when they do with small opportunities, they'll be given more opportunities. The unfaithful ones, they dishonor the master's resources because the opportunities were given to them and they didn't even try. That's the punchline. It wasn't about that you can do something with what you have. No, it's, it's about that you didn't even take the opportunity when God has given it to you to further his kingdom. You see, brothers and sisters, God wants his servants to take advantage of the opportunities that he provides to further the kingdom. In verse 30, it says this, and this is how Jesus ends the parable. He says, uh, now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Whoa. Uh, into darkness, typically darkness means an absence of God. And then... Um, Gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth means the agony of being um, separated from God. Um, so what does this mean? Does this mean that if you don't take the opportunities that God gives you, that you're going to lose your salvation? No, I would say no. Because remember I said that parable, you don't press all the meanings of every little part of the story to, to something. I think it's just a general judgment. There's accountability to it. It's not talking about salvation. That's not the issue. The issue is are you willing to risk for the kingdom of God when the opportunity that God gives to you is there? And so the point is, faithfulness is taking a risk for the kingdom. The point is to try to do something to be productive with God when he presents you with an opportunity. And notice in this parable, who was the one that was condemned? It was the one who didn't do anything. One commentator said this, that, even if the other, com if he had done something, he had failed, the master would still commend him because he tried. At least he tried. He didn't just sit on it. He didn't just hide it. He didn't just bury it in the earth. And so we look at this. I think the parable says something to us about maybe during this lifetime, God might give us some affirmation some promotion and celebration. If you take it to mean that, that Jesus can come at any time into your life and tell you. 
It's not at the end. So think about this. We typically will say at the end of a, like a funeral, say, oh, this, this person was a good and faithful servant. This parable doesn't say that at the, when they died, then that's what they said. It was during their lifetime. So I think that it more relates to the destruction of, of the temple, that, that God is implying that, that God will affirm whenever in our lifetime, before we are gone, he's going to tell us that we're good and we're faithful. You don't have to wait until you die. Although that's still okay, okay? And I would have to say that maybe over my lifetime, I've, Jesus in some way has done that for me. He said, good and faithful servant here in this, in this area and this area and through various means. I mean, he's, he's doing that. So let me ask you a question. How can we please the Lord in this in his kingdom? By taking risk. Acting on the opportunities with God's resources for the kingdom. That's what I think this parable is telling us. Here's one more point. A minor point. There is no room for lazy Christians among God's people. You think so? I think that's pretty valid. There's no room for lazy Christians. He wants the he wants, and I mean, because he wants to work through us. He has work for us to do. He wants us to make a difference for the kingdom. And that's what it is to be a faithful Christian. I want to be like the five bag a servant. I want to be like the two bag servant. That they did it. They, they took the opportunity and did something. With a, I don't want to be like the one bag servant. You know, he was afraid and he didn't do anything. He didn't even try. And brothers and sisters, I think that's what Satan wants us to do. Don't even try. So what is a faithful servant of God? Faithful servants are those that honor their master's resources to make his priorities our priority, that we would risk for the kingdom of God. We risk those opportunities when he brings it to us. You say, okay, that's good and well, but like what? Here's some, here's some possibilities, some suggested things. Maybe God's giving the opportunity to be a part of a praise team. Uh, right now, online, we, we could have some people help us. We need people to do some of the recording and some of the editing. And maybe that's something that God has resourced you with. Why not? Uh, maybe it's God saying that that he wants you to take a risk. You have an opportunity to have a small group or create a small group fellowship or a Bible study in your home, maybe, or maybe on Zoom. How about um, being a part of our church caring ministry? That's something, too. You want to do something, and the opportunity is there. Is God asking you to be a part of that? Or how about this? This is This is even easier. It's just inviting people to our church. We have opportunities all around. To invite people. Uh, invite them online to listen to our, our, our church, our messages. Invite them to Sunday school. But I tell you what, faithful servants are those that honor the master's resources and make his priority, his kingdom priority, our priority. And that we would risk for the kingdom of God. That's the punchline of this parable. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And we ask, Lord, you forgive us for the times that we were just playing it safe. We don't know how many opportunities have passed our way, but we want a purpose right now not to waste any that come, any of the ones that you bring our way now. Lord, grant us the courage to live by faith and not by fear. We care about what your opinion is of us. May we be your good and faithful servants, and then you let us know. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, it's good to be with you, and I pray that you would want to be a faithful servant. Don't hide what God has given to you. Look for the opportunities and take them. This is the only time that you'll have to do it. All right, take care, and we'll see you next time. Hello, Chinese Baptist Church in Central Orange County. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you. We're so grateful for the part you play in ministry. I'm Scott Jennings, and this is my wife, 
Elaine Jennings, and we're going to share a little bit about our ministry with you today. Uh, for myself, I'm involved in Campus Crusade for Christ Global Operations, where we're serving to help our ministries around the world and having a lot of the backdrop systems so that our missionaries can easily serve on the field. One of the things that I've been involved in is transitioning our countries to our new finance and human resources system. We've already had over 200 ministries transition into that over the last two years. And this has really helped a lot of ministries, especially with less developed economies, to really have a greater uh, possibility of serving for the Great Commission. Whereas at one point, staff had to all live next to a major city um, so they could get their um, salaries in cash. Now they're able to go out to the other parts of their countries, out by the borders, and even next door to Muslim countries or others abroad because they know that they're going to get taken care of because our new system allows them to be paid electronically. And that's one way that we're seeing a great impact for the gospel. And I've been serving with Women's Resources, which is um, has the goal of encouraging and resourcing uh, and giving a voice to our global staff women spread throughout the world. Um, we do this in a number of ways. We've been doing some things with social media. We also have a website that um, collects and shares stories from our staff um, in various countries, in Africa, um, in Asia. Uh, our most recent stories, we've had um, people sharing from everywhere, from Venezuela to Ghana. And so uh, it's a support for us to hear from each other and see God's work around the world. Um, and I've also been involved in a, an online mentoring ministry where uh, we have the ability to share with women who don't know the Lord, who have been trapped in their houses during COVID-19, have a lot of spiritual questions, and have responded to some of our websites um, with inquiries about their spiritual life, about who is God, about how they relate to Him. And so that's been a really encouraging and unique opportunity um, to be a part of during this time. So we just want to thank you for being a part of our ministry, and we hope to be able to see you in the near future. Thank you. Hi, church. I don't want you to forget that at 4 p.m. today, we have a church family Q&A. All right. See you then.